Well, hello guys. <laughs> David both here. Oh my goodness, it's a beautiful day here in Oklahoma. The wind's kind of stirring and it's kind of giving a breeze, a nice breeze. And hope you're having a wonderful day where you are. Well, I want to get right into this uh, podcast today. We're, we're going to talk about something that may just very well end up being one of the better videos we've done in a long time. Because I wanted to get back to this. We were talking about when we were showing with Google Earth, we were looking down into the oceans and we were seeing all these vast tunnels. And we said we were going to get back to that and tell you guys what that was, not just in a vague way, but we're going to see if there is any way to know for sure. Our eyes are telling us that there's tunnels down there. Here's the problem, I believe. Many of us are Christians, and we believe in the Bible, and if the Bible's true, then there should be some um, reference to these big tunnels under the earth. Now, we do have references to various things. We have Atlantis, but that's something most Christians aren't really familiar with. The New Agers believe in that a lot. And I've talked about it. How does that correlate? Remember, it was sunk under the sea. Right? And all the peoples drowned. Well, that is a correlation with our story in the Bible of the flood. But then we start thinking about it and we realize that in the Hindu writings and some Sumerian tablets, it's far too far in the past to what to be what we thought the flood was because Christianity has always been told that the flood only happened about 4,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago but maybe 3,500 BC and that doesn't correspond because we're Today we're looking at the earth in its geological understanding. Scientists tell us that the strata of the earth can show us when all the floods and the ice ages and all these things happened, right? Droughts <laughs> for millions of years. I think one thing we can do is we need to go back. I've tried to do this. Go back to the story of the Bible because I happen to have a lot of hope and faith that the Bible's true, but we're not understanding it all. And I have evidence for that galore. I've convinced myself of it. But I always keep an open mind about everything. Of course, I have more than just physical evidence for this. But, it, it, but no matter what kind of evidence you have, I mean, if you spoke to angels, if God spoke to you on a daily basis, you'd still have to decide what your reality was. You know, you might be a little bit wacko, maybe. Maybe the voices in your head aren't God. You know I mean? There are always possibilities. So we have to be very careful, make sure we can, can establish, first of all, that we're sane. And then when we take all the evidence, not only does it have to fit together, but it has to make some sense. Like we can have all the proof in the world that the moon was made out of green cheese. I mean, absolute, we got scriptures for it. See, it says right there in, in, in the chapter of the book of moon that all the great Tartarians lived on the moon and it was made from cheese. Now, now you see, that's it. Case closed. And I don't want to speak to you ever again, you heathen. We can't do that because that's a scripture. Okay. Let's say it is. When, until you know for a fact, that everything you believe has a reason and fits and you understand the whole cosmology of what you're saying, then many of the things that you're looking at could be out of place or misunderstood. So it's possible in your world that your book of moon is just a forgery. You must consider that possibility. Okay? Look, I believe... In all of the scriptures. But I've done. I've come to that conclusion after 
years of research, I kept an open mind and I found facts that back it all up and put it all together. Now, what what is happening is a lot of people are believing in something without having done a lot of research, right? So, obviously, we know all the truth. And whatever we know is all you ever need to know. So just read our magazines and books. Well, that doesn't lead anywhere. And it's kind of what the flat earthers are doing. They don't want to think carefully about ancient scientists and stuff, ancient truth, except where somebody has already done the work for them and has cherry-picked some ideas from the ancient past that sounds like it uh, approves of their ways that they're believing. So then they'll say, now it says in Aristotle's works, this, that, and therefore we're, we're right. But they didn't read all of Aristotle and where he got his teachings and how it came from the ancient priesthood. They don't understand. The, I mean, who could? It's too much information. You and I, we've been going through this, all this information. It's difficult because we've got people angrily telling us we're going to go to hell if we even look into that. We can't, we're born into a world where we're, we're, we're ashamed to even think about the possibility that God may not exist or, or, or to, cause we've got to consider every little thing when we're really contemplating it. So why are we here? And so with all of that fear and intimidation and propaganda, no one's ever really been able to go back and, and, and let's throw in their mistranslations of the Bible and the fact that languages over per long periods of time changes the meanings of words. And we're going to show that here. The serious problem we're having of not even knowing what some of the words mean that we're reading in the Old Testament. So... We've got a word in the Old Testament that we translate. We got several words that we translate hell. Okay. Nowhere in the Old Testament is the word hell or in the new. That's another modern word. And it's weird because really nobody knows where the word hell came from. Although hell might be like the word cellar or a hole, you know, uh, a hole hell, similar. And there are synonymous words like pit, cave, underground tunnels that you might think of a hell or a cellar or a hole. But some say that hell didn't come from that. It came from the word in Hebrew, sheol, sheol, S-H-E-O-L, and the Greek Hades. So I guess they just took the old part and added the first part of the, or the H on Hades and called it hell. I don't know. But it's a combination of the Greek Hades and the Hebrew Sheol. So when you're trying to figure out what it is, Christians, that's difficult for them. Because most Christians don't believe in mythology or the Titans. And it's funny because Jesus talked about the the angels who sinned, and he, they were thrown into Tartarus, which again is a different place than hell. Or it's actually, according to the Greeks, in Hades. But it's the lowest portion or the lowest area in Hades. So it was Hades had different sections. Well, the Hebrews had that too. But no one's ever really able to correlate any of this because we're not allowed. Because that's not our religion. So in the Old Testament, we've got various synonyms. We don't know if they're synonyms to hell or Sheol or if they're areas of hell. We've got the lowest pit or the bottomless pit or the abyss. We've got just the word Sheol. We've got the word pit by itself. There's uh, different words. In the New Testament, again, we have different words. One is the Valley of Hinnom. In Hebrew, it's the Valley of Hinnom. But in Greek, they just 
transliterate it. They don't translate it, like whatever that word means, and translate it into Greek. They just write it, each letter, but now in Greek letters. And so now it's Gehenna or Gehenim. Hinnim was some man. We don't know what this valley of Hinnim was, but I will tell you, we're going to have an answer for you what it is in this video. The, and, and I'll give you a clue. The word valley is not really in the old Hebrew. They've translated that valley, but it's not a valley. The word is a deep underground tavern. cavern. That's just a hint. We'll get to that. So Gehenna in, he, in Greek is a pit. Remember, Jerusalem is just a big city that at some point became the capital of Israel. It was in the southern area of Israel. There was a northern area and a southern area. The Jews, composed of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, lived in the south. And the other ten tribes, which are now lost, were in the north. And they worshipped, they didn't worship at Jerusalem. They worshipped at Beth El. And El means the divine being. And Beth means the house. So their house or temple wasn't to Yahweh. The northern tribes worshipped El. But in the south, it was considered a low place. It's very symbolic. The Dead Sea was down there. That's the lowest place on earth. There's pits of bitumen. And it was symbolic, used very symbolically all the way through the Old Testament as a place similar to this hell. And so the Jordan River was the lowest river on earth. And this is why people were being baptized into the river. Because it represented something that in ceremonial ways that the ancient ones had been trying to teach in all of the ancient nations. In Egypt, they looked at the stars and the stars would go down over the horizon into the night sky. They said they died and they called that the Duat, which is their word for Sheol or Hades. And they went down in the, the realm of the dead in the darkness. It wasn't really a place of fire at all. Although there were compartments. And one compartment was the lowest pit. And there was some fire down there. And serpents. And scorpions. And this is why we have Scorpio on the wheel of rebirth. Down at the right side at the bottom of the wheel. And on the left side is water. And there's Pisces and Aquarius and stuff. And a fish god named uh, Capricorn. A fish goat god. And so there was, there was more than one area. There was the sea. Poseidon ruled over that. And Hades ruled over the other area. And the bottomless pit was at the very, very bottom. There were regions. And the Greeks called that Tartarus. And the, the Greek New Testament mentions the word Tartarus specifically as the place that the angels were imprisoned. It was the lowest pit. And other places calls that the, the great dragon, which drags a third of the stars of heaven. And he's in the blackness of the darkness forever. Imprisoned there in the night sky. So the night sky was considered the abyss, not the heavens. The heavens was the blue sky and the sun was Jesus. Anu means heaven. And Jesus was the light or the sun. So they believed this way. But aside from the various regions, remember, the black was when it was nighttime. So the earth had already turned upside down. That was the bottom side. So under the ground, there was another area called the first realm. Remember, the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus ascended. After he died, he went to hell. He went to hell. And then he ascended far above all principalities and powers and dominions. But it says, the apostle says, what is it that he ascended? But that he first descended. 
and there's here's the important phraseology into the lower regions beneath the earth so there's more than one region there are lower regions with an s and we can document those particular terms in the old and the new testament so one of the names in the new testament for this area not the bottomless pit that's a different place not tartarus if you're going to use the greek word if you're going to use the word pit or bottomless pit that's just a translation of the hebrew word obisios in the sumerian it's abzu and this tiamat lived in the abzu that's the dragon that's what we see in the book of revelation this is all hinted at all throughout the the, the ancient teachings but one of the main words, and this is why Christians like Jehovah's Witnesses can't understand this, and they don't want you to look into it, because there's various words. One of them is Gehenna that we mentioned. Gehenna had nothing to do with the black sky, the night sky. It wasn't the lowest place. It wasn't the abyss. And it wasn't all of Hades proper or Sheol. But you might say it was the first realm where the dead went, where they were initially taken. And it was called Gehenna. And it was an underground cavern. Now, beyond that, there were, when, when the righteous died, they also were brought into caves. Jesus was mummified. I mean, this goes back to the ancient temples and the ancient esoteric teachings from Egypt and from Babylon and Sumer and Mesoamerican, and China, and all the nations of the earth. The righteous would be mummified and put in a tomb, in which is a cave. And there were designated caves with holes that went deep into the ground. So in the story of Jesus, he's wrapped and mummified with spices and linen and oils to preserve certain spices and some people think they put cinnamon on him, right? To make him smell nice. Maybe they did. But these spices were to embalm him. To keep his flesh preserved for a journey. Because they believed that the... Now remember, a lot of people, like scientists today, say, well, this is ridiculous. Right? Or do you think that, that if there were some scientists in the earth in those days that could preserve your body, like a resurrection that they'd need to wait that long? Why did they just take you? Why did they have to die? If they were so smart, they could just rapture you at the time. You know, what, are, what do you got to die for if they're going to save you? Because you're not going to be able to preserve that body for more than what? Let's say you could ball, embalm that body some way that would preserve the body for four, five, six days. Hey, you're not going to be able to keep anybody alive much longer than that unless they're going to go. Maybe they've got genetics. They can clone you. But what's with all the embalming? Do, was it just some sort of elaborate ceremony that they went through knowing that, of course, you were going to rot eventually? But it's just a symbol of the fact that, well, the good people get embalmed and, you know, and buried in good tombs under the ground where the angels watch over them. No, 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 no. You see, the reality is that only the, the very few people got this kind of burial they were gods they were the pharaohs or jesus or certain ones family royalty most people were thrown into gehenna especially robbers and thieves and other foreigners or whatever they just threw them into the now they weren't just remember we get this all mixed up they weren't just thrown into gehenna or this this pit outside of jerusalem it's like it's just some sort of garbage pit i remember growing up in being told it was just a garbage pit. And and there was sulfur down there smoking all the time. And so they'd throw the body and it would just kind of smolder. And that's how they got rid of the bodies. But symbolically, since their bodies burned up, it was just saying, you're, you're not worthy of resurrection. That's all it was. But what we never were told is that there were caves that went off from the main channel. This pit. They throw them into the pit. And then they had these caves. And I will show you the historical references to where the K 
cave came out, the, the, the hole, the bottomless pits they're talking about, and how there were individuals and gods that were supposed to have lived in the caves that took the bodies. No, they, this was an integral part of their beliefs, including the Old Testament. Thank you very much. For you Christians who believe wholeheartedly in the Old Testament and you think Yahweh is your father. But yet, the book of Acts chapter 7 says that Yahweh is Molech. It was Yahweh who wanted sacrifices. And this is what he wanted you to do. Remember, he says, all the firstborn are mine, saith Yahweh. Now, you can redeem your firstborn by giving me a lamb. And over and over throughout the year, I want all your lambs and your firstborn lambs and all your firstborn goats and all your firstborn cattle and all your firstborn chickens and all your, you know, I don't, just all your crops and, and some bread and, you know, oh, Yahweh ate, literally, it tells you in the Old Testament. They sat down at a table with Yahweh and they saw him face to face and they ate with him. Moses did, the 70 elders did, Abraham ate a meal brought out the fattened calf. His servants cooked it up. They made bread and wine. And they sat down and ate and drank with Yahweh. And it says that his actual nose, his nostrils, would smell the odor of them cooking the barbecue. And it was a restful odor to his nostrils. And they, and there are other verses in the Old Testament where, where they would, they would have a banquet and, you know, the priests would eat at one table. They'd get the best part of the shank or the shoulder or something. And the rest of the meat would get to, would, it would go to the family on the celebrations. And a certain portion, the fatty pieces, the liver, the heart, the pancreas or whatever, the, and the fat around that area and the blood was prepared for Yahweh. And so these these barbecue pits weren't what we think. They weren't just a stack, a rock stack with where they just burned it and it went up into smoke and it was gone. Because God is spirit. No, they were cooking it. They didn't burn it all up. They ate the darn thing. And by the way, guys, fish, you could never use as an offering. It had no blood. And fish don't cry. Fish, fish didn't have a soul. You couldn't offer a fish a life for a life, a soul for a soul. If you sinned, you could offer up a lamb and, and to die in your stead. Or if you were supposed to be giving your firstborn to the, to the Lord, you could offer up a sheep. That's what Abraham did. Remember, Yahweh wanted him to sacrifice his son Isaac. So, Yahweh wanted the, the actual flesh cooked and barbecued. Now, you've seen pictures where they would offer up their babies to Molech. Sometimes they call him Baal. I don't know, you know, if they know what they're talking about. But this is the stories that we were told. The truth is it was Yahweh that asked for this kind of thing. He was the God, Yahweh, and in Sumerian is Iya, Ya, and K. And in the Hebrew, it's written just that way. Iya, and OK. It's, that's the first two words on the tablets that Moses came down off the mountain with. Enoch Ea. Yahweh in the Inki. So, and it was the Ea of the Sumerians that created man. Created Adam. And refused to allow Adam to become immortal and did not grant him to eat from the tree of life. So, Molech would, would, was living in caves at the, there were entrances from the valley of, or they call it the valley, but it was, it really means the deep underground pit of Gehenna. And there were other tunnels that led off from that, that led deep into the earth, and we'll read about who it was that was put in there and all about that. So we've got several scriptures, a lot, uh, quite a few verses in the Old Testament that speak of Raphaim. Um, some say that the meaning of Raphaim is the terrible ones. 
But I don't think that's the meaning. It has two meanings, according to the scholars, you know, because they always want to give you the real meaning, like, vaguely, because I guess they have to tell us the truth. And then they'll always throw in the one that doesn't mean nothing, and that's the one you're supposed to believe. But the one, the first one they use in poetic literature, and it refers to departed spirits. And they say that their dwelling was in Sheol. And they said it was like our concept of a ghost. Their second meaning for Rephiam is a mighty people who were very tall like giants that lived in Canaan. They say it doesn't seem to be a, a name, Rephiam, like a name like uh, Cain or Canaanites, Canaanites or, or, or Philistines or something like that. It's not like that, like Egyptian. But it was a, a descriptive word to describe somebody. Now, the first time that this word Rephiam is used is in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 5. And it says that the Rephiam and the Zuzim and the Imim went to battle with Abraham, with Chedorlaomer and his allies. So, interesting because in our Bible, it just says Imim and Zuzim and all this. And we don't know. It's like there's different tribes, a bunch of tribes. But you, when you get to looking at that, some of the words mean something like terrible ones or ghosts or or, or, you know, weird words that we're just don't get translated. So that's why we don't know what this is about. But in Numbers chapter 13, 33, it calls them the Nephilim. And it says they're the sons of Anak. Now, see, that's where the Sumerians come in because they called them the Anunnaki. Anak or Anaki all comes from the same word. So in the Hebrew, we we find out that the reason they're called the Anunnaki is because there was a, somebody named Anak. And these were their children. They were giants. Well, that's very similar to Enoch or, or Inki. Because as we said, Inki in Hebrew is Enoki. And they refer to Enoch, the sons of Yahweh. But they had different names in different places. I mean, they had different descriptions or something. Because like I said, they're sometimes called Zuzim, or M.M. or Anakim. Anakim. Remember, Anna is the high, the the heaven. And, and M on the end is plural. So, that could mean lots of things, but Anak, M, means the son of Anak. So, Deuteronomy 2 and verse 20 says that the Rephim were very tall, they were giants. And it mentions one called Og, king of Bashan. And he was said to be the last of the Rephaim. Like it says in Deuteronomy 3.11. It says that his bed was 13 feet long and 6 feet wide. Well, Bashan is a mountain range because he was Og, king of Bashan. Bashan is a mountain range in northern Palestine, up above, like up in Syria. And the highest peak of Bashan is Hermon. And all the books, the, the Apocryphon of Enoch and, and other books of Enoch and, and the Sumerian, every, all these ancient writings say that there was a deity, one of the gods that fell with his 200 uh, watchers. Some books call them the watchers. But it's obvious that when you get to the New Testament, they're called the angels that fell. They were they were banished somewhere. Well, and this this story is very consistent. It's written in historical documents as reality, not as some mythology. Even though in some places in the Bible you might think, or, or in other stories from other countries, it maybe sounds mythological. Mythological. And we'll talk about that. We'll probably have to do several videos on this because we've got a lot of stuff to cover from the Mesoamericans, the, the, the Chaldeans, the, 
uh, we got to cover the Atlanteans and all, there's so much that we want to talk about to prove this. So we know exactly what the Bible's talking about. That this is not some mixed up jumble that we can't figure out because if we just knew how to understand the Bible, we'd find that all of this Atlantis and all of this Mesoamerica and this, and the Greek giants that were thrown into Tartarus and all this stuff is real. As New Newton so eloquently said, these mythologies are real people. This is real history. But the mount of called Hermon, at the base of that mountain, there's a place, there's a pit called the Gates of Hell. And this is there to this very day. It's where Jesus took the disciples and stood at the base of Mount Hermon. And looking at this pit, this gate said, I will build my congregation, Peter. You are a stone. You are the stone that, you know, Joseph would be, would, would have the stone of Israel. And we've talked about how I believe what I'm, what the scriptures teach about this particular, there are 12 tribes. And so Peter is the tribe of Joseph. He's the stone. And Jesus said, upon this stone, I'll build my congregation. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And he was looking straight at the historical area where Satan, which was Yahweh on Mount Sinai, rebelled and gave us these laws of judgment and curses and bondages. And he made government, the beast, and his anger and in his wrath. And he made a pact with his angels. And so it's interesting too, that this place called Bashan or Mount Hermon with the gate of Hades is also where a specific Anunnaki or Anakim or Nephilim or Giborim, which sometimes they're called in the Old Testament, which means the mighty, the heroes, the great men, the Titanic or the Titans, one of them is named by name here, and his name is Og, which is an odd name, a very appropriate name for a great giant. You can almost imagine a big eye right in his forehead, right? <laughs> Jack and the Beanstalk, right? Well, Og is a funny name, and it's not used too many, I don't think, any other places, except it is. Remember Hebrews from left to right. And so, a lot of times, you end up having it both ways. So, in the book of uh, Ezekiel and in the book of Revelation, it talks about the war of Gog. Which I think is interesting because we have the word God today. Which I believe, I know it is no coincidence, that it is God, God, Gult is from the Germanic word Woden or Goden. And they have their horns that they wear. And they, like all the other nations, for a long period of time, when they went through their warring stages and conquering around the world, they worshipped the lower god in the bottom of the wheel because it was Yahweh that taught their hands for warfare, David said, to conquer the then known world and to worship Yahweh and have these laws of, of putting people to death and warring and slavery and all of the stuff that, that mankind has done. So the God of the Old Testament, the God of this world, in the European area was called Golden, Gold. And it literally is in, in certain, uh, Scandinavian languages, that's the same word for goat. Because, just like all the other, you know, like Baal looks like a bull, right? And so they worshipped this goat-looking bull. You've seen it, sometimes they call it Baphomet. It's got two horns and it looks just like a goat. But it's always on a five-sided star, which, if turned up right, has got a man crucified on it, which is Jesus on the top of the wheel. Because there are two equinoxes and two solstices. And when the thing is upside down, then it representing the, the winter solstice, which is Capricorn, 
which is the bottom of the wheel. And so Gog may very well be Og, the last of the giants. Why would he be given a name, the one that we, the last one that the Bible talks about? Because, uh, well, I mean, he's not the last one because, you know, I mean, years later, David comes along and kills Goliath. But it does say that he was the last of the Rephiam. And I think it's important. And, and it says something about how um, later on talks about how they had six fingers and six toes. And this is all symbolic, too, of the story in Revelation with the 666. And there's another reference to Solomon making a statue of gold with six cubits and six, you know, it, it, it had the 666 dimensions as well. So it's, it has to do with greed and it has to do with buying and selling in gold and building a one world government based on trade and based on the laws of Yahweh, which is, you know, commerce and buying and selling and so forth. So the Septuagint uses that Greek word gigas or, you know, like giant and Titanus, which is, you know, where we get the word Titan. And it uses those two words to translate the other verses. The ancient Jews did consider these beings to be real, substantial giants. Usually they, they would say they were seven feet tall to nine feet or even 13 feet tall. I think there was a reference to one of them that might be as tall as 16 feet high. And they were called mighty men. The Egyptians wrote about the giants in Canaan. There are a lot of mythologies and stories from every nation. But where did they come from? Well, you've heard about Genesis 6, 4, or 6, 1 through 4, where it says that the angels or the sons of God had relations, sexual relations with the daughters of men. And they took wives for themselves. Now, if it was just talking about humans marrying humans, it wouldn't be a big deal. Of course, humans take wives for themselves. But this is a story. We know that it's a story about these giants because in other apocryphal books and, and, and books that I don't even consider apocryphal because I, I consider Genesis to be an excerpt from Jasher and Jubilees, which we still have and which I believe are as, as inspired as any other book that we might have. And they call the, these Nephilim literally the sons of the of the gods and 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 the the bible does too by saying they were the sons of anak and by saying they're rathiam which we're going to find out what that means so rathiam is a hebrew word and they say it comes from ugaratic or phoenician sources the bible traces this word to a word without the M on the end, like Rapha. We have a word in the Old Testament, which is Rapha. Same thing with Anakim. They have the word the sons of Anak, and then they say Anakim, because that's plural. So Rapha and Raphim, Raphim is the plural of Rapha. Well, Rapha in 2 Samuel 21, 16, 18, and 20, and First Chronicles 20 and verse 8, is some being, some giant. The Bible tells us that these Rephiim are giants, for sure. But the second place that the Bible uses Rephiim uses it in a sentence whereby you have to assume it's talking about spirits and not even physical beings. Or some say shades or ghosts. It's a poetic synonym for mitim. And in Isaiah 26, 14, and Psalms 88, 11, it uses it for ghost. It refers to 
the inhabitants of the nether realm or the, you know, if you call it the nether realm, I guess because the word nether sounds in English like something spirit, like something not physical. We assume that the nether world is a spirit realm. Well, after all, if there are spirit beings called Rephiam there, then maybe it is. But Proverbs 9.18 says, Little do they know that the dead are there, and her guests are deep in the realm of the dead. Let me read that to you in the interlinear, word for word from the Hebrew. And it says, But not he does know that the Rephiam are there in the depths, in the deep of hell. And there are her guests. So obviously this word Rephiam doesn't always have the connotation of a physical giant being running around with a, a spear. And there are various verses in the Old Testament that, that, that sounds like it's talking about a ghost. But most of the ancient peoples used this word Rephiim. And a lot of times they did use it in terms of this concept that we have today of ghosts or spirits that go to hell. So Phoenicians did this. Uh, there was a Phoenician king named Tabnit of Sidon. And he says, quote, May there be no resting place for you with the Rephiim. The Ugaratic material is even more hard to understand because there are a lot of texts that refer to the, to a, a it's a word they, they use that, that is R-P-U-M or P being like an F, P-H, Rephim. We have fragmentary documents that people are trying to interpret that uses this word. And they say of this Rephim, kind of like the Phoenicians, that they have a divine nature. They're like the gods. They're referred to as il Nim, or, you know, I-L is sometimes the way they would spell E-L or L. So, il Nim really means the divine ones. Hebrew Elohim. So they were called divine beings. We see this in 1 Samuel 28, 13, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 19. But they, we don't have a real clear clue as to what these Rephiim or which deities they were or why they were gods and why now they were in, they were in hell. Not unless you understand all of the stories and the mythologies and put them all together. There were one function that they had that seemed to be a military function. Sometimes they were referred to as MHR, or soldiers. They, had, they were described riding on chariots. But as we said, the Bible uses this word, Rapha, as though it's like the progenitor of the Raphaim. Well, there is a book called the Ras Shamra, and it mentions this RPU, or Rapha. Rapha Milklam. Milklam is Molech. So RPU, or Repha, who is called the Eternal King, is described as a GTR, or a Mighty One. And of course we know that in the Bible they're called Mighty Warriors. So they had these huge stature and they would contribute to military armies. It's funny because even David had one of these giants in his army. Remember when David saw... Bathsheba bathing or whatever and he had to have her. Well, her husband was one of these very tall giants. And he had him... He was very loyal to David. He was fighting in the in the armies with David. And he put him in the front of the line and he ended up getting murdered in battle. And then he was able to marry Bathsheba. So... 
because these other Ugaratic texts mentions this RPU as a particular deity, we have to assume that this is the same Rafa that the Bible's talking about, that's one of these deities. And we know the Phoenicians also used the word Raphaim to represent a ghost or a spirit as well. So, Rafa may have been some one of these deities, and just like Anak, who had the his, his sons, who were the Anakim, Rafa had the Rephiim. Why then are they later on, because initially in the Bible, they're just talked about as these giants, and they went to war and had fought, fights, and Moses fought with one of them called Og. He was the last of the Rephiim. But yet, in the Bible and in other texts, I mean, throughout the Bible, we read the one in Proverbs, but it speaks as them as spirits in the land of the dead, in the land of the of the netherworld. Well, we said that one of the things that he, the word Rephium is connected to is this word valley. It calls it the valley of the Rephium. And as we said, if you look the word valley up, it doesn't really mean valley. It means a deep place or a very deep place place it, you know if it, a valley may be a deep place right it's deeper than the hill but it wouldn't use the word deep place for a valley because it really is talking about the depths deep beneath the earth so below the city of jerusalem there is this huge ravine and everybody talks about it all the time and it's in the, the new testament there is a um, grassy area that leads down a slope and then it descends quickly down into the ravines and crevices in the earth and it's got scars and deep caves and pits that are hollowed out chambers and they say there are there is these very narrow little crypts or tombs or caves where the dead were thrown Everywhere you see along the sides of this pit, scorched, black, they sometimes say there are sulfurous smells and odors and, and, uh, smoke coming up from the, the pit. They have rivulets of urine trickling down because people have sewers in Jerusalem that lead right into the pit and it just drains right into it. And this has been going on for thousands of years. There are weird bushes that have thorns on them. You can't even get down there if you wanted to. Weeds and lots of weird bushes and outcroppings. It smells of a stench so utterly terrible, like decaying flesh. Putridge, garbage. It reeks of spoiled feces and dead bodies. And, and this is what the Bible's talking about when it says that the worm doth not die and the fire is not quenched. It's very poetic. Yes, it is. And yet, if you think about it, what we're saying here is this is actually literal in some sense of the word. I mean, it's, it's, uh, exaggerated poetic imagery but if you listen carefully when you're near the edge of the cliff people say they can hear the screams of babies being tormented people being burned alive incantations priests mumbling and secret rituals being done that echoes throughout the canyon. You can hear agonized cries of victims crying out for help. Where do these stories come from? Could they possibly have any truth to them? Well, some say this is the real hell. But today I want to show you guys, it's not only the real hell, but why it could possibly be the real hell. What are we talking about? We've got to be able to distinguish reality from Polaroid. We've got to be able to understand and make some kind of sense because these people that lived in these times, they may have been 
illiterate. They might have been ancient ones who didn't have the schooling that you and I have, but they weren't stupid. That is the valley of Ben Hinnim, the valley of the sons of Hinnim, named from an ancient person that lived in that area during the first temple period, maybe a thousand years before Christ or before that. Today, this area still exists there in Jerusalem, in the land of Israel today. And you guys know about the fact that they're arguing over land. But nobody is touching this valley called the Valley of Gehenna. The Arabs that live down there don't try to use it or improve the land. It's nothing but a dump. And the Jews don't want the land, and they haven't touched it either. Nothing has changed there for centuries. You can still see deep cuts in the, in the, in the cliffs and stones that look scorched and burned. And one of the names that, that this little area was called was the, was the, is Tophet. And it was where they had pagan altars, according to the, the Jews. That was made years before Christ ever came. The altars of Tophet are named for a noisy drum that these mysterious shamans would be beating to their dark deity, Molech. They say that they beat drums and would light fires and sacrifice babies to Molech. And the reason they would beat their drums is to drown out the, the crying and the screams and the parents that would be screaming for their children. But underneath the ancient Tophet altars, you can still see certain little entrance ways. They're barely big enough for a human to squeeze through. But they're literally carved out of that cave. There were people. There had to be people. They were carved out. And they were called crypts. And in these chambers, they would do these terrible rituals to sacrifice these babies and these humans to some evil god, which we can prove this has gotten so convoluted that nowadays we're told because of the fact that these people that used to live there, the Ugaratic texts, the Canaanites, and these people are not allowed to speak. They were wiped off the face of the earth. And so now all the information we have is there in the Old Testament, and it's not translated correctly, as we've, we've been seeing. So we're not getting the full understanding of what's going on here. But Acts chapter 17 and Amos tell us that Yahweh was this God who started this sacrificing of children and told Abraham to give him his son. And so this is why Jerusalem, the God of Yahweh, is at the entrance of hell. On both ends of the country. Up by Mount Hermon is the gates of hell. And at the very bottom in the area of the Dead Sea where all the sulfur and these bitumen pits have caves that lead underground. Where the god of the bottom of the wheel, Ea, would send his priests to receive the offerings. We supposedly know very little about Molech. And archaeologists only can speculate about this valley of Gehenna. But we do know that little babies were tied down. Innocent little babies to little small platforms that were extended down into the cavern so that they could make their offerings to the gods. It was a hideous place. And this place... My friends, is outside the walls of Jerusalem. That is where this gate of hell exists. Beyond a doubt, it isn't in some other country. It's not in Russia. It isn't in China. It's not in Saudi Arabia or down in Mecca. This mountain where Jesus was crucified, this valley of 
death is right here in the lowest place on earth called Jerusalem. We know that all of this information has been convoluted for a reason, so that we wouldn't understand who we are and where we're going after death. Everything's been jumbled up. So the Jews today couldn't tell you whether they believed in an afterlife. Most Jews say that hell is just a place where everybody goes, and I think it's more like what Jehovah's Witnesses teach, and it's just a place of oblivion. And all of this is that we're talking about in the Bible, and all these stories is just symbolic. And there really isn't any Gehenna. It's just symbolic of the fact you throw your, your body down there, and it rots, and gets burned up in the fire. Okay, what is it a symbol of? Well, the Jews don't know. But we know that Jesus taught about this great chasm. And he taught that on one side of the chasm was the paradise, and the other side was the lowest pit, which he called Tartarus, the lowest area. Now, the Greeks talked about this pit, or this, I mean, uh, this gorge, this river. They called it the River Styx. You had to cross the River Styx and progress along the way, and the angels would take you to a place of paradise or a place of torture depending on your deeds. This is why Jesus said there was the rich man that was that lifted up his eyes after he died and was in torments in this place of fire, like like Gehenna with the, the sulfur and the fire and the worm doth not die and the, and the pits of, of bitumum. And he was in torture down there. And he said, oh, please send an angel to my family and tell them don't do bad things and don't get into this place. But then they looked and they saw Lazarus in the bosom position with Abraham sitting at a great banquet. The Greeks call it the Isle of the Elysians. So definitely there were more clear, precise teaching than what many in the Orthodox community of Jews today believe about their scriptures. They seem to have no clue as to what all of this means. It's like they haven't put it together or they don't want to put it together. Because there isn't any concrete Jewish idea of the afterlife. If it was just a place of silence, right? Non-existence, oblivion, you're dead, you're gone, you're out of existence. You'll just sleep, right? That's what I was taught as a kid. It's just a place to go and sleep and never wake up. Then why is it that many of the prophets talked about such torment in hell? Isaiah talks about this, um, and the book of Daniel, it talks about the shame and everlasting contempt for the evildoers. In the book of Enoch, there is this particular paragraph that says, They brought me, Enoch, to a place of darkness and to a mountain, the point of whose summit reached into heaven. And I came to the river in which the fire flows like water. And he continues on in the next chapter saying, This place is the end of heaven and earth. This has become a prison for the stars and the host of heaven, which have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. Remember when Jesus said he preached to the spirits in prison? Do you think it's talking hyperbolic or parabolic, or just poetically. Jesus meant something. I know that Jesus doesn't say things to us that couldn't be possibly true. And if we don't have consciousness after this life, then this entire parable of Jesus and of Enoch would make no sense. The book of Matthew Chapter 5, verse 29, Jesus says, If your right eye causes you to sin, take it out and throw it away. It's better to lose a part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell. Now, remember, this word is Gehenna. This is an actual place where people were actually thrown. 
where they were actually sacrificed to gods who came up out of the pits and took the body down below. I want to read something to you guys real quick. Because this is crazy. And most Christians and people around the world don't know about this. But this is an actual story, an actual reality that exists in the land of Palestine or Israel today. It's called the road to hell. It says, it turns out it's not easy to get to the uttermost depths of hell. No Jewish taxi will drive there because strangers and Israelis are frequently stoned by embittered villagers. So hire an Arab taxi to drive down a service ramp. And then along the filthy trek that is Gehenna, even the Arab driver will resist. Pay extra, pay extra. When the taxi can proceed no further down, get out and scramble up a short rocky ridge, two scruffy Arab boys across the way may jeer, wagging their fingers and shouting warnings to turn back. Disregard them and walk to the edge of the cliff face. There you'll find a great cave, its arched entrance guarded by six-foot-high thorn bushes, impenetrable urine from the unsewered toilet in the convent above, the very convent that legend claims to be founded with Jesus' blood money, trickles from its open pipe down the inscrapment and over the cave's entrance. Theses from man and beast lie everywhere. Rodents dart and snakes slither. Here is the lowest point of Gea bin Hinnom, the absolute pit. On either side of the cave entrance, hung from spikes driven into the rock, are twine strangled jackals, angry snarls, and frozen in death. What is very interesting is that if this concept of hell is entirely only symbolic. And Jesus Christ literally, physically, actually died and drained his blood on the ground on a cross outside of the gates of Jerusalem. His blood ran down through the cracks straight down to this deepest point in the valley of Gehenna. And it says that Jesus himself went and preached to the spirits in prison. But like we said, there are various layers. And the first layer was beneath the ground. Obviously, the spirit doesn't remain there, but the bodies do go there. And if the body is goes there and is burned up or eaten up, then you probably are not looking at reusing that body again. You'll have to come back and reincarnate in another body. The angels will take you to wherever you need to go. Whether it be a good place like the Elysian Islands or Tartarus or the pit, which is probably a spiritual place, the abyss, the bottomless pit, which we talked about, is it is in the blackness where the dragon breathing beast lives. But if these deep pits exist, who made them? Well, we've just seen that it's some deity that lives down there. Some people call him Rapha, and his children were the Raphaim. And one of the last of the Raphaim was Og, who lived up in Bashan, or the Mount Hermon, where the, the gate to hell is. And Moses conquered him. He was a real person. David King David was a real person in the genealogy of Christ. And so when he conquered him, he sent him someplace which prophecy says he would one day return from the bottomless pit. But who made the bottomless pit? Well, remember, uh, the stories go back to Atlantis when the gods came and made this huge civilization. I think we'll have to cover that in another video because this is where it's going to get into the, the, the correlation between Atlantis and the gods and the giants and the flood 
and all of that we'll do in another video. But I will show you who made these caves. Judges chapter 6 verse 2, the power of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves holes which were in the mountains and caves and great strongholds in the mountains. First Samuel 13, 6, when the men of Israel saw that they were in strait, for the people were hard pressed, the people hid themselves in caves, in the cliffs, in the holes, in deep pits under the ground. 1 Kings 18.4 When Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in the cave. And he would provide them food, bread and water. Jesus said of these people, the Jews, remember he said, your father is the devil. We talked already about Acts chapter 7 that says that Yahweh was Molech. And so Jesus says many things to the Pharisees. Your God is from beneath. He's the devil. He's a liar. He's a murderer. But here he says, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of robbers. Why is it a den, a hole, a cave of robbers because the robbers and the thieves, they oftentimes would hide in the caves to get away from their just rewards. And we're going to find how in the book of Revelation it talks about in the latter days, there will be those who enter into the caves of the earth. So they don't get punished. They're trying to hide. 1 Samuel 22 and verse 1, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adulam. This was a very specific place that great King David went. And it wasn't just a little cave because it says, and when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. But look at verse 2 Samuel 23, 13. Three of the 30 chief men went down and came to David in the harvest time in the cave of Adulam. And while a troop of the Philistines was camping in the valley of Rephaim. Now again, a whole army was resting in a little valley. That's not what the word means. That valley means a deep underground cavern. A deep underground something. And it's called the deep underground area of the Raphaim, which as we've shown in Proverbs, and there's other verses in the Bible, many, several places in Psalms, Isaiah, where it calls the Raphaim ghosts, or the dead. The dead that are imprisoned under the earth. And so this low valley happens to come and join the Valley of Hinnom. They're mentioned together. First Chronicles 11.15 Now there was 30 chief men went down to David into the cave of Adullam while the army of the Philistines was camping in the Valley of the Rephaim. Ezekiel 33.27 Thus I shall say unto them, Thus says the Lord, As I live, surely those who are in the waste places will fall by the sword. And whoever is in the open field, I will give to the beasts to be devoured. And those who are in the strongholds and in the caves under the earth will die of pestilence. Job 30 and verse 6 says, So they that dwell in the dreadful valleys, in the holes of the earth and in the rocks. Okay, do you really think that there are all these armies hiding in little holes in the rocks? Little dinky caves. No, this is the great valley of the Rephaim. And it is called the holes that are in the earth. In Genesis 19.30, Lot went up from Zoar and stayed in the mountains and his two daughters with him. 
for he was afraid to stay in Zoar. And he stayed in a cave, he and his two daughters. You, you ever wondered if that whole area, Sodom and Gomorrah, and five cities around about was an entire, the book of the Babylonian tablets say it was the entire region, like Saudi Arabia, all the way over to Iraq and Egypt. That whole area was completely destroyed by fire, by nuclear attack or something. And um, if that were the case, how is it that Lot is able to survive and his two daughters, but his wife has turned into a pillar of assault? I think it's because, remember, the angels grabbed Lot by the scruff of his neck, him and his two daughters, and took him to Zoar, which is a place, which is a place of rest. And I think that was a cave. And I don't think it was just a little hole in the rock. But we're talking about these deep underground caverns. I um, don't have time in this video to go into this any further, but you might remember that Elijah went to Mount Horeb and stayed in a cave and got instructions from the Lord. We know that Jesus spent some time in the desert up on a mountain, but there are cases, for instance, the story of Mary Magdalene when they went to Marcel, France. The story goes that she went and stayed in a cave for 30 years and never ate food for 30 years. And then the assumption where she was taken at the end of these 30 years. I believe that nobody can go without food for 30 years. Now, look, it could be that she was, you know, because there's scriptures in the Bible about Elijah and the same kind of thing. He didn't eat food, but it says the ravens would come and feed him. So what is the ravens? Mm, I don't know. But they may be symbolic of some kind of angels or something. But in this case, I doubt that they're telling you about this cave for nothing. Remember, there's the cave in the Himalayans that goes to Shambhala. And I do believe that there are various caves that lead to various places. And so Mary Magdalene was never found. Her body was never found. This is why it's so important. And, and it's regarded as some great miracle that she never ate for 30 years. I believe she was at the entrance of a place, like a wormhole, and she was in complete in constant contact with Jesus. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and close there. We're going to talk about this more because there's a whole lot more we want to integrate. We're going to talk about Atlantis and a lot of the, the, the stories around the world. People in ancient tribes talk about where they came from and they all describe exactly the same place. And this these stories all go back the story that Plato gives us about Atlantis. We'll find out what this word Atlantis means. It has something to do with Atlas, which is the, the gates of Atlas. Today we call Gibraltar, which is beyond the gates of Gibraltar, which is in the Atlantic. And we'll talk about the prophets. Uh, Roger uh, uh, Francis Bacon talks about this. And Joseph Smith talks about this. This was... A remnant of that area, Atlantis, is America. And so, we'll be able to find out where and what it means that these people made these the city. Because Atlantis was a very odd place. I don't think people understand what Atlantis was. There was parts of Atlantis that was up on ground level. But Atlantis, according to Plato, was a very centrifugal maze of tunnels that was at some point flooded over. So we'll get into that tomorrow. I'm going to go ahead and go. Hope you guys have a great day. Have a good one.